We're so pleased you've joined us today for St. Stephen's Online. We're praying for you as you watch this, wherever you're tuning in from. Lord God, be with us as we worship together and listen to today's talk. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I never. Who you are, and I'm loved by you. 
Why not open your Bible or click on the link below to read the passage before we hear from our speaker. Good evening, let's just let's take a moment to pray. Father, uh, send your spirit on us now. Thank you that you're present with us. Come open our ears, come soften our hearts and give us the courage to um, not just hear but to um, Follow where you lead us tonight and as we go ahead. Amen. Well, it is um, it's lovely to be here tonight um, with you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, we're so blessed at All Souls. Um, about this time last year, I think it was, when Rachel came and visited us and shared with us on our series in Acts. Um, if you're not aware, All Souls Church is just over the 316, uh, near the Elsa Tavern, it's just down there, um, and really exists today um, because of the generosity of St Stephen's planting back into it um, back in 2000 when it looked very likely to shut down. Um, so thank you <laughs> um, for your generosity. And um, I've been vicar there for about two and a half years, uh, which means I'm just beginning to get a bit of a handle on uh, what we're about. Um, and the answer is Jesus. <laughs> uh, we spend a lot of time of, you know, kind of praying about and trying to discern our sort of our vision and our, and our mission. We're sort of there with that now. Um, and our parish includes the Ivy Bridge Estate, which is sort of between Asda and Tesco, if you know that part of town, um, which is another area that St. Stephen's planted into back in 2000. And that's been the focus of a lot of our ministry and our mission over the last, uh, well, down the years, really. And um, we've been gifted two amazing curates at the moment, uh, Ritesh Patelia, who actually lives on Ivy Bridge, which is just wonderful. And then the uh, brilliant Mike English, who is one of your own, um, who joined us on a free transfer in the summer. I know some of you guys uh, know him well. And they both send their greetings, as does my new neighbour, uh, uh, Reverend Dave Cocaine, who lives uh, just across the road from me, actually, which is really nice. And he's the neighbour in Paris as well. I saw him in, in, yesterday day before yesterday, he said his greetings, so he says hi. I'll take your greetings back. Um, for myself, um, so I'm married to Jess, um, we have three boys, age 12 and 9 and 6. Um, brothers is a whole new dynamic for both of our families. My, my wife is one of three girls, her sister's got three girls, I've got two sisters, both our dads are only children, so there's been no brothers for like two or three generations. Um, so this is a whole new kind of dynamic for us, we're learning fast, it never feels really quite fast enough. Um, and uh, what else? My background is youth work, and I'm a big Luton Town fan. <laughs> Anyone else in the room? Luton Town fans? Okay, fair enough. Come on. 35 million. Do you know what that is? That's the amount of money we have spent on transfers ever in 135 years. All right? Come on. Uh, never mind. <laughs> Pray for you later. Right, if anyone who is anyone visiting tonight, anyone here for the first time, just me then. All right. Um, this is part three, I think, of a series on 1 Thessalonians looking at what it means and what it takes to live distinctively as followers of Jesus in a world that isn't big on that. The Thessalonian church was one of the first communities established by Paul and Silas in this kind of mixed Jewish Greek city. And Paul and Silas, they preached there for three weeks. And people turned to Christ, but then some bad characters, that's Luke's words in Acts 17, you can go check out the backstory if you haven't done that already. They stir up trouble by saying that these Christians are defying Caesar, claiming that there's another king. And it sort of echoes of Pilate and Jesus in the crowd when they sort of say, oh, we have no king but Caesar. So just three weeks after arriving, Paul and Silas are, are kind of smuggled down to the city and they leave not knowing what's going to become of this, this fledgling church. So the context of this letter is this kind of brief but intense start followed by this enforced separation. Paul and Silas go away not knowing what's going to become of, of these believers. So in our reading, it says that when they could bear it no longer, they couldn't bear not knowing any longer, Paul and Silas, they send Timothy on a mission to check out what has happened. And 
Timothy comes back with kind of news beyond anything that they could have hoped for. The Thessalonian church not only exists, but it's standing firm and it's thriving. And in fact, kind of against all odds, it's almost become, it seems, a kind of a model church. If you read all of Paul's letters, there aren't many that come close to being as positive as 1 Thessalonians. Paul thinks they're great. And in kind of the moment Timothy returns and gives his report, he says he immediately wrote this letter. He can't wait to reconnect with them. And so kind of briefly, the first half of the letter then is kind of about re-establishing that connection to Paul and the Thessalonians. And then the second half of the letter, which I guess you're getting onto next week then, is about Paul kind of using that renewed connection to uh, kind of instruct and inf- and form the Thessalonians. So kind of hold on to that two-step process, kind of making the connection and then using that connection. It's kind of a little bit the, the kind of the theme of what I'm sharing tonight. So the verses we're looking at then are about the sorrow of separation and the fierce desire and the power of being together. And the title I've been given is Christian Friendship, Longing to Share. So let's talk about friendship. So I've had a bit of a mixed experience of friendship over the course of my life growing up, and especially in my teenage years, I felt incredibly insecure about my friendships. Um, I had friends around me. I had one really loyal friend at, at school, um, and then I had a kind of a much wider circle of friends. Um, but I always felt they kind of more tolerated, kind of r- rather than really enjoyed my presence. I, I, I kind of wanted them to like me. In fact, I tried really hard, but um, the truth is I, I didn't have great social skills. I was a terrible listener. I'm still am sometimes. Um, I talk too much. Still do sometimes. <laughs> And it just seems that I kind of have this natural talent for annoying people um, without trying. Yeah, I was, I was that kid. Um, and I had ginger hair as well. So I know. And I, I really wanted to be a good friend, but I just didn't really know how to be a good friend. And I think there's a valid question here. How are we meant to learn? how to be good friends. Countless books have been written on romantic relationships, how to be a good husband or wife, um, or parenting, how to be a good parent, or success with kind of work colleagues. But if you search for books on how to be a good friend, the results that come back are mostly based on how to win friends, which I don't think is quite the same thing. So I did what I couldn't do when I was an insecure teenager, and I asked Google for advice about friendship. And this is what it came up with. This is the highlighted answer to that search, uh, advice about friendship. It said, remember that you deserve to have friends that accept your decisions and make you feel comfortable. And let me read that again. I wasn't organized to get my slides in on time. Um, I've got some old school visual aids later, you'll see. Um, but if you're visual learners, don't worry, hang on, your moment will come. You deserve to have friends that accept your decisions and make you feel comfortable. Hmm. Okay, where to go next then, other than the TV show Friends? <laughs> you can see I went really deep with my research for this talk. So Friends was a show that me and my friends were watching us talking about as we were growing up in our teenage years. It's responsible for an awful lot, I feel, mostly bad. And uh, I thought that it had been consigned to history, but it, you know, in recent years it's experienced something of a revival and a new generation of teenage devotees. Um, and what I did is I searched for lessons about friendship from the show Friends, expecting to be able to load up as a preacher on the kind of the immorality and vapidness of Hollywood. But to my immense shock, and perhaps horror would be a better word, the author of this article seem to draw out exactly the same points that I wanted to draw out from this passage in 1 Thessalonians. I know. So here goes. This is the gospel about friendship according to friends and 1 Thessalonians. So first point. Christian friendship takes intentionality. Here's what that friends article said. Friends make space in busy schedules for each other. And then under that statement, they sort of have the image of the gang of six, you know, Rachel, Ross, Chandler, Phoebe, Monica, and Joey, all sat together on sofas, as they so often were, at the cafe, which they went to, which was called... I did, well done. Good. Um, sorry if you don't get these references, in, in truth, you're probably better off if you don't know. 
But the point being that if for no other reason than to make the plot work, the group regularly hang out together. They devoted themselves to time, to serious time with one another. This is 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 and 18. Can we have these verses on the screen, verses 17 and 18 from the reading? Let's see if that works. Brilliant. That's looking, I think. Right? Um, but, brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. Those are the key words. They made every effort to see you. The language Paul uses here is really strong. The, the words are kind of intense longing convey almost this kind of desperate craving. The Greek word is a really strong word, and it's used mostly in the Bible relating to lust or coveting. Paul had this incredible concern for them, expressed in this desire to be with them. And I don't know if it's sort of too long ago now to invoke the pandemic. Um, it all seems so sort of strangely timeless now. Uh, but remember that intense aching to see loved ones in person. You know, Paul is desperate to see them. So he made every effort. So the first question I want to ask you tonight is where do your friendships come on your priorities list? I'm talking specifically about Christian friendships here. You know, the, one of the biggest predictors of who you will be five years from now is said to be your five closest friends today. In terms of your values and your outlook and your priorities. Friends form us, but that formation can only take place with intentionality and time. You know, for some of you, maybe you're, like, you're sort of really busy, and you think of friendship almost as something as a bit of a kind of almost self-indulgent. You know, something if I've got a bit of spare time, then maybe I can devote a bit of time to that. But it's really not. It's the key to who you're going to become. I didn't have the best experience of friendship as a teenager. Today I have two really, really good friends, Jason and Kieran. And for the past sort of 12 years, I think now we've been really intentionally involving ourselves in each other's lives. We live quite far apart now. I think that's a, a common theme for people. And we struggle to go deeper in friendships because we all move about so much. But our dates to get together are some of the first things in our diaries every year. And it's taken sustained effort and intentionality. But the rewards from that have been so good as we've kind of gone deeper together and we've been able to speak wisdom and truth and challenge into each other's lives in a way that we're so grateful for. But it's taken real intention. So the first challenge then is make a greater priority of your formational friendships. Who uses a paper diary here? You hand off a used paper diary. Okay, you put your hands down, right? Trick question as well. I mean, it's the rest of you using mobile phones, okay? So get your phones out now, okay? If you've got a phone, you've got a diary on your phone. Paper people, you're just gonna have to remember this later. And my challenge to you is, either get your diary out or get your to-do list out and put some time in, even if it's just 30 minutes, to think about how you're gonna make every effort for your friendships in 2024. Put some time aside or put it on your to-do list so that you actually think about it and actually pray about it. Where are the paper diary people again? Okay, does anyone want a 2024 diary? Keep your hand up, the back there. All right, you can have it. You've won. A diary. Okay. Next stuff, don't run the microphone on, sorry. <laughs> right. Make every effort. You've got to put, the first thing you've got to write in that diary now is some time with some friends, okay? That's the one. First, Christian friendship is intentional. Second, Christian friendship pays the cost. Back to our friend's article. It said this, although everyone seems to be doing pretty well financially in the end, for much of the early seasons, half of the Friends gang are making significantly less than the other half. It all comes to a head over a celebratory dinner which they can't afford. I can't remember that episode. Can you remember that episode? Okay, this sounds. All right. 
This is uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 to 3. Maybe we can get those verses up again, 1 to 3. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens, Paul and Silas, and choosing to go without them for the sake of their friends. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. So maybe the link between paying for a meal and Paul and Silas sending Timothy to Thessalonica is a little bit tenuous, but the common theme is friendship costs. You know, today is Remembrance Sunday, isn't it? And one of the key verses which is used in our commemorations of Jesus' words about the cost of friendship, John 15, verse 13, he said this to his disciples, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus knew that friendship would cost him, literally, to call you his friend. He died for you so he could be your saviour and your friend. That's pretty extreme, but it's a kind of a benchmark of sorts. It was great just singing that kind of on repeat for a little while earlier, wasn't it, as well? I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross. That's the cost that he chose to pay for you and for me. It's so easy to be consumerist about our friendships. I'm talking to myself here. You know, we've become so wrapped up in our own needs that we look to our friends mostly in terms of what they can do for us. For his friend's sake, Paul sent Timothy at cost to himself. I wonder what God might call you to do for your friends at your own cost. Maybe it's something as simple as cooking a meal. Maybe it's shouting them a drink. Maybe it's helping them come to focus on new wine or whatever summer festival you might be going on. Maybe if it might be you're a big talker, it might just be about really intentionally listening. And particularly when we come and we know we have our needs and we have the things that are going on for us and we really feel desperate to share that. You know, maybe the cost will be just stopping for a while and listening and making that space for them. Maybe it's simply to write a letter like Paul did. Maybe there's a, a kind of a Christian friend out there you could just do with a letter this week. What we do is just let's take a moment and pause before we move on and just to be still. And just say, Holy Spirit, come speak to us now. And just ask the Lord to put on your heart a friend that he might be asking you to do something for at your own cost. Three more chocolate coins. Anyone else want to admit to having a friend that, that, that the Lord has maybe put on their heart? Okay. Thomas has got chocolate coins. Otherwise, Rachel put her hand up, so she gets a chocolate coin. Okay, I'll let you see. All right. So, Christian friendship is intentional. Christian friendship pays the cost. Rachel, Rachel put her hand up. She did? She did? Yeah. Um, especially church leaders. Church leaders really need to remember to be intentional about friendship. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there you go. Um, second, Christian friendship pays the cost. Third, Christian friendship prays. So let's have verse 10 up if we can on chapter 3. Uh, Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you'll be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. There's notice in that that Paul prays first about that thing about being able to see them again and about 
being able to give to them. So both of the kind of points we've made so far, you can actually pray those things in. God, help me, show me where to find the time for this. God, help me to bear the cost. Paul goes beyond that to praying for them. He doesn't just pray for health or a good day. He prays for an increase in their love. He prays for a boost in their faith. He prays for strengthening of their hearts, a passion for holiness and for God's presence. I just want to be honest here for a moment. That isn't what I pray most of the time when I pray for my friends. I don't pray for their faith and their love and their holiness to increase. I don't pray for a greater sense of God's presence in their lives. Most of the time, that's not what I pray. And I guess I realise preparing this that I really should be doing that more. Back to the guide on friendship from friends. And this is the one I want to push back on a little bit. Friends believe in each other's dreams. I think that's true. I think it's right that we support each other in our passions, but I'd add something as well. Someone once said that prayer is a sign that you want something better for someone than it is in your own power to grant. You're saying that I want you to be blessed beyond what I can give you myself. And we also believe that God has better for our friends and our, us, us ourselves than what we are, ourselves or they are able to dream. Going back to that kind of bit of advice from the beginning, you deserve to have the friends that accept your decision to make you feel comfortable. I think my problem with that is that it assumes that the greatest gift we can give our friends is absolute, uncritical approval. Leave them be, nothing more. But if we really want to grow, what we need is friends who we feel can safely challenge our decisions, make us feel uncomfortable from time to time. That's the kind of friendship that Paul models, isn't it? You're going to see that in the next few weeks. Of course, affirmation is important, really important. But in prayer, we are saying that God has even better for you than the limits of your own horizons. God wants more for your friends than they can currently see. I just want to throw it out there that prayer should be kind of part of every Christian friendship. You know, when you get together, be the person who brings Jesus into the evening or on your walk or on your talk or over your coffee. Take a moment at the end of your time together to pray about anything that has come up, just for a couple of minutes. Listen to God together. He might have something for your friend that he wants you to share. But, um, you know, great times when that's been the case, where my friends have spoken into my lives. Make prayer a habit. And um, finally on prayer, I just wonder if some of you are sitting there thinking, as I did in my, kind of my teens and my twenties really, I really wish I could find that kind of friendship, those sorts of deep friendships. Or I've been really looking for that. Or maybe you feel like I used to have those kind of friendships, but something has stopped that. You know, stats show that we have on average now fewer close friends than ever before, despite the kind of unprecedented digital access. I mentioned my friends Jason and Kieran. I found those guys when I turned 30. Okay, I would say that I've been looking for something like that for years. Paul prayed that God would make a way for him to connect with the first million disciples again. He also said, I don't know if you noticed this, that Satan had blocked the way. And I would say that there's a this kind of final thing I really want to say, that there's an element of spiritual battle that goes on around Christian friendship. Satan loves to divide and to isolate, to keep people apart. It all starts back in Genesis 2. If you're lacking the kind of friends that you would like to help form you over time, pray that God will make a way. So pray for Christian friendship and pray for your Christian friends. The final giveaway I have, um, you know, the toothbrushes. I've got 10 of these. Um, here's one way to remember um, uh, to pray uh, these things for your friends. So I, we do a thing called like the, the toothbrushing prayer. <coughs> And all it is is that um, we, we come up with something that we're praying about while we're brushing our teeth, because then we know we'll do it twice a day. 
um, at least, or three if you're really keen. Um, and I've got bits of paper uh, which look like this, which just have those verses, the, the, the prayer that Paul prayed to the Thessalonians there. And underneath is space for you to write uh, five names of friends who you're going to spend, and you stick it in your sink, and then you remember every time you brush your teeth. Um, so Thomas uh, has a good ordinance. Is that right? You're an ordinance, Thomas. He's going to distribute it. So uh, uh, put your hands up, claim a, a free toothbrush and a bit of paper, and then you can remember to pray for your friends. So. I don't know if you should give the toothbrush to the people with the massive chocolate coins or not. Is that a thing or not? So while he does that, so three kind of takeaways. Make sure the youth get some over there. Because they're like, I'm not saying you don't brush your teeth, I'm just saying, you know. Pray. Um, <laughs> Christian friendship, like, you know what? I'm no one to talk. It's very easy. You can come to another church and pretend that you are really good at stuff that you really know. I really struggle with praying for my friends. This is... Even having to prepare this sermon is like a good challenge to me, so hopefully I'll better take one of those. All right. Not getting at anyone tonight. Three takeaways from tonight, then, as we come into land there. So, like, Christian friendship is intentional. Make every effort. Get it in your diary for 2024. Time with those friends. Um, second, Christian friendship bears the cost. How is God calling you to bear the cost for your friends? And third, Christian friendship. Pray, pray for your Christian friends, or pray for Christian friends. And you know, realistically, I'm not expecting you to go away and do all of those things, but I just wonder if you know, just one of those three things resonates with you tonight. Maybe the Holy Spirit is nudging you about one of those three things. Which one would it be? We hope you enjoyed today's worship and talk. If you'd like to find out more about St Stephen's, please head to our website, follow us on social media or contact the church office.